So my sermon today is called, If Only I Had Known. Anybody ever had that <laughs> phrase in your head? You know, when you start the year like this, and you're like, all these amazing intentions and plans, and by the end of the year, you're just like, what happened? I know the end of my 2022, I looked back and I thought to myself, if only I had known at the beginning of the year what was going to happen, <laughs> things would have turned out a little bit different, or I would have done this differently, or I would have tweaked this, or said this, or whatever it may be. And that's the reality. I went through a very interesting um, situation last year. Uh, we were on our way to take our kids to Kids Church uh, out in Philippi, and we got hijacked. And you know, after that, thankfully God restored everything back. People found the car. You know, it was just an amazing thing. But, you know, in all of that, afterwards, I kept on asking myself the question, if only I'd known I wouldn't have taken that road that day. <laughs> if only I'd known, maybe I would have been more aware and more alert. And we always have these only I had known questions or statements. Now you think of the, the you think of Abraham in the Bible. You know he had this promise that he got from God, an amazing promise. You're going to be a great nation. You're going to have a son. You're going to be famous. You're going to have riches and wealth and all of these things. And he actually got to the end of that, and he actually was able to see a lot of that come about. So there was a promise, and he was able to see the fulfillment of that promise. But I do wonder to himself. When he got those promises and it came to fulfillment, I wonder if he actually looked back and said the same thing. If only I had known. If only I had known what God was going to do. And that's Abraham's journey. And a lot happened between the promise and the fulfillment. And you know what? God has given every single one of us promises. You know, we sometimes think promises are like these big, massive things. But a promise could be you're in a family. Promise could be marriage. Promise could be singleness. Promise could be a business that you've stepped into. A promise can be a job that you're in, a school that you're in, a family that you're in, a community that you're in. You know, we always think it's these amazing things, but most of the time, the things that we're in, in the moment, is a promise from God that's come about. And so today we're going to look at this whole thing of promise and fulfillment. And I thought, you know what, let's dig a little bit into this because Abraham went through all these seasons and experiences and feelings between the promise and the fulfillment. And we go through the same thing. We go through very similar things. And so we're going to dig a little bit into his story. I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey of Abraham between the promise and the fulfillment. And we're going to dig out some key thoughts and, and principles that hopefully will help you now, but also for the rest of this year. Because this year is going to be a journey, yes? Hey, it's going to be a journey that we're going to go through. And so hopefully this is going to help you. So we're going to dig into Genesis 12. If you've got your Bibles, grab that out. Always good to have a Bible. If not, it is on the screen. So you can look there. Genesis 12, verse 1 through to 9, it says this. It says, The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, your father's household, to a land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I'll curse those who curse you. And all peoples on this earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from, from Iran. He took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abraham traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah of Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there, he went onward to the hills uh, east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west, I on the east. And there he built another altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abraham set out and continued to Negev. And so this was the beginning. Season one, faith. Abraham gets this promise from God. And the promise sounds quite amazing, hey? I mean, the season of faith, even though a promise may sound amazing, it comes down to hearing the promise and then obeying the promise. And that's what he had to step into. And you may say, yeah, but, you know, Abraham had it pretty, pretty easy. I mean, think of that promise. 
Imagine if God gave you a promise like this. You're going to be a great nation. I'll bless you. Your name's going to be great. Blessings and all these things. You're going to be famous. Da, 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 da. Imagine that. You know, if you got that promise today, maybe somebody prophesied that over you or you got that from God personally in your time with him, you'd be like pretty amped, hey? I'd be like, yes, let's do this year. We can do this. All of that amazing stuff is going to follow. But the interesting thing about Abraham is that in the season of faith, he had to exercise or experience two things. Number one, sacrifice. He had to leave his family. He had to go out on his own. And the other thing that he had to experience in that season was impossibility. At that point, Sarah was already barren. And God's saying to him, but you're going to be a great nation. Do you think he was sitting there going, I hear you, God, but my wife can't have kids. There was this thing there between faith and sacrifice and impossibility, a tension almost between the two spheres. And Abraham had to say, I'm going to make a sacrifice for something that actually seems totally impossible. Ever experienced that before? Sacrificing something for something that seems impossible. And so in seasons of faith, that's where God takes us. In seasons of faith, when he gives us a promise or we step into something new, there's going to be sacrifice and there's going to be impossibility. Those two are always going to be playing in the mix. And that's where it brings in the faith. Because if you can do it by yourself, then you don't need God, hey? And this promise was given to them. And Abraham was 75 years old. 75 years old, he gets this promise. But he says to God, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to step out. Even though it's a sacrifice, even though it seems totally impossible, I'm going to step out. I'm going to walk in this thing. And so he steps into the season of faith. Let's read on. Genesis 12 verse 10 says, Now there was a famine in the land, and Abraham went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was so severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarah, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but will, sorry, then they will kill me, but will let the woman you, oh, sorry, then they will kill me, but will let you live. Say you are my sister so that I will be treated well for your sake and my life will be spared because of you. When Abraham came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarah was a very beautiful woman. And when the Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abraham well for her sake, and Abraham acquired sheep, cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious illnesses on Pharaoh and his household because of Abraham's wife, Sarah. So Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me? He said, why didn't you tell me this was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? So that I took her to be my wife. Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men, and they sent them on their way with, their wife, with his wife and everything he had. Season two, the famine. Typically, when you step out in faith, what do you expect? Famines? <laughs> Not really, hey? You expect blessings from God. Hey? You expect amazing things, especially when God's given you this amazing uh, a promise. But sometimes when we step out in obedience and faith, we actually step into seasons of famine, seasons of difficulty. You see, God's regular way of working is to give his people famines in the midst of their faith. That's God's regular way of working if you look at the Bible. I mean, you look at James. James says that in chapter 1. He says, you know, count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And so tests may not come immediately when you step into a promise or you're in a promise, but they will come. They will come, and it doesn't mean it's a bad thing. Famine is not a bad place. You know, famine is actually more than an event in Abraham's life. Famine in the land caused a famine in Abram's heart. And that's where the problem came in. See, Abram loved God. But as Abraham searched for food, he actually strayed from God. And you know what? That can happen to us, hey? We can be Christians. We can come to church. 
seemingly doing all the most amazing things, but yet somewhere in our own hearts, we are far from God. We're straying from God. We're far from the heart of God. You know, the first time we hear Abraham talk in the Bible, the first time we hear him talk, he says the words, tell them you are my sister. <laughs> first time this great man of faith talks, it's a lie. It's a cover-up. And we can get to that place, you know. And why did he do this? Was he scared for his life? God had given him a promise, so that was there. But maybe he thought to himself, you know what, I can't die because there's this promise. So I need to take things into my own hands. <laughs> Ever had that situation? You know, after that hijacking, yeah, I wanted to take things into my own hands. I started thinking, maybe I should get a gun. <laughs> you know, you start thinking all these things. Maybe I should start doing whatever, to try and defend myself. And I started going into this crazy place of not trusting God. I was in faith when I stepped up, but now I'm starting to get into a place of unfaith. And that's what happened with him. You see, we've got to be careful in the famine. It was literally like Abraham actually saying in this moment, God isn't ruling and reigning. He can't control what happens in Egypt but I can, so I will. And so he spins this amazing story. But the interesting thing about this, and this is where we have to be careful in famines, is there are pharaohs. There are pharaohs. You know him as a seemingly a brother to his sister, which was his wife. No one could come. If, if a man would come and say, I want your uh, sister, they'd obviously have to go through negotiations and all that sort of thing. And maybe that was a place where Abraham thought, okay, if I spin this little lie and some guy says he wants my, my wife, who's actually my sister, um, then maybe they can, uh, that can give me a little bit of time to get out of Egypt. So maybe he was trying to preserve them as a family, but he didn't realize that there, were, there was a pharaoh in the land. And unfortunately, in every single one of our lives, there are pharaohs. There's someone, something, some situation, some temptation that could actually take away everything from us. The crazy thing is Abraham actually got a lot of riches out of this. He got camels and donkeys and slaves. He got all these things out of this situation. But yes, he lost what was most dear to him, his wife in that situation, and his relationship with God, the faith that he had in God. And so famine wasn't actually the issue. It is what happened in the famine that was the issue. And so even in our own lives, we may be in something in faith. You may start the year in faith and a famine comes and you're just like, what the heck just happened? What happened to God's promises of an amazing year? <laughs> what happened? Watch what happens in the famine. Make sure that the famine doesn't the outside affects you on the inside and cause a famine within your own heart. Does it make sense? Next season is family. Genesis 13 talks about Lot and Abraham. And it says in verse 8, So Abraham said to Lot, Let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between our herders and mine, for we are close relatives. It is not the whole, is not the whole land before you. Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. And so here was the situation. Abraham and Lot, they all had their herdsmen, everything, and they started this quarreling started. And so Abraham decided, I'm going to take a stand for this. And so he says to Lot, Let's part ways. But you can take what's best. You can take the best. Do you know season of family is sometimes about sacrifice? I think I see this a lot with parents, with even younger kids, you know. It's a sacrifice. And sometimes you can even lose your thought that, man, God has a promise. Because you're just like, man, my whole life is about these kids, hey? Anyone experience that? That's a place that you can get into. But it's not necessarily a bad place. And that's what we see here, because here Abraham actually said there were three things that he really stood up in, was humility, his faith in God, and boundaries. And humility, Abraham said to Lot, you know what, I don't want to fight with you. I don't want to do that. You take the best of the land. Go for it. You can take the best of the land. Why was Abraham able to do that? Because he had faith in God. He knew the promise. And that was his thing that he held on to. So he was able to have humility in the season of family. He was able to step into that. And so Lot got the best of the land, but Abraham still had the promise. Abraham still had a promise of this land. And you know what? Your family, 
can take the best from you, but God still has a promise. Hey? God still has a promise. Whatever situation you're in in your family, God still has a promise. But I want to say, and this comes down to boundaries, is don't allow family to take the best of you. See, Abraham actually had to say, let us separate because this is going to take from our relationship, from our family. So your family can take the best from you, but not the best of you. Catch that? So your family can take the best from you, but don't let it take the best of you, who you are. Don't ever lose your relationship with God. Lose your faith in God because of family. Lose the sight of the promise because of family. Amen? Does it make sense? And so this is the understanding, this is the season of family. Season four, everyone fine? Great, season four, here we go. Genesis 14. Four kings are there. These four kings came and they uh, defeated the king of Sodom. And they take all the people in possessions. And among these people in possessions is Abraham's nephew, Lot. And so they, now he's been taken captive. And so Abraham goes to rescue Lot. And Abraham rescues Lot, and usually as the plunder, um, you as the king can take, or, or whoever you are, um, you can actually take all the possessions and the people. And so Abraham has defeated these four kings, which was an absolute miracle, gets his nephew back, Lot, and, and the family back. But then the king of Sodom, which was the one that was defeated before the four kings, he comes to Abraham and he said, listen, and it says this in verse 21, it says, the king of Sodom said to Abraham, give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, with raised hand, I have sworn an oath to the Lord, the God most high, the creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or a strap of sandal, so that you'll never be able to say, I made Abraham rich. I will accept nothing from you. This is a season of future looking, future perspective. See, Abraham doesn't keep all the recovered stolen goods. The king of Sodom says to him, actually, please keep it. Keep all the possessions. Just give me the people back. Interesting. Think about the Abraham from Egypt. Hey, The Abraham in Egypt was all about what I can get. You know, I'm covering my tracks. I'm making sure that I'm going to stay alive, all of that. Now, this is a whole new Abraham. He had grown from the season of Egypt. See, in Egypt, it had to do with himself. I'm indispensable. God needs me for this problem. I need to take this into my own hands. And his reward was possessions. This situation was totally different. Abraham says, you know what? I did this for my family. I did this for my family. And you know what? I don't even want to benefit from it. I don't want the possessions. I just want my family back. Here's Abraham stepping into a new realm. He's learned from the past and he stepped into something. And this decision secured his future in God instead of laying a snare for the future. Hey? Abraham now secured his future in God instead of laying a snare for his future. We need to be careful of our decisions. We're going to go into seasons where we're going to have to make decisions that are going to affect our future. And that's where we always got to come back to God and say, God, what is the decision in this season? Where do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Give me wisdom in it. You see, we all need to make wise decisions for our futures. Guys, all good? Can you tell me the, the seasons? Let's try it. Season one was? Faith. Season two was? Famine. Three? Family. Four? Future looking. Five? I'll find a way. This is the classic part. We all know this story, I'm sure. Genesis 15 and 16. Genesis 15, it says, After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield. I'm your great reward. But Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit, sorry, and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. How's this? There's this promise of a great nation. Abraham's going, man, this is taking a bit long. At this point, 
Abraham was 85 years old, so it had been 10 years from the promise. He's like, man, this is taking me long. I think I need to make a way myself. Let me find a way. So he comes to God and he says, what about my servant? And God says, no, it's not your servant. Then there's Sarah in Genesis 16. And she says this, and it says this, now Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him also no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abraham, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. This was Sarah's, let me find a way. I wonder with Sarah, when Abraham first got the promise from God, I wonder if Sarah was actually there. I wonder if she was there when Abraham had encountered God. I wonder if she, over 10 years, had started to think to herself, man, maybe I'm the problem here. Because God's given Abraham a promise. I'm his wife, yes, but nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. Maybe she began to doubt herself, doubt her abilities, doubt her uh, purpose in the promise. And maybe she decided, listen, you can have Hagar because I don't think it's me that you're supposed to because I'm barren. How many of us start to figure out our own way because we begin to doubt ourselves? Hey, we begin to doubt ourselves. Abraham doubted God when he said, let me make a way with a servant. He can be the heir. Sarah doubted God. Or Sarah struggled with the promise because she doubted herself. And there's those two things that we always need to be aware of. When we're in a promise or you're in a job, you're in a relationship, you're in a marriage, and you start thinking, I'm going to make a way. I'm not going to do it God's way exactly. Let me make a way. Think about it, relationships. All the single people out there, all the single people, you know, you're not finding that guy or that girl in church. (laughs) So you're just like, ah. It's fine if I just go, let me go clubbing this weekend and try to find the guy there. You know, let me, let me just, you know, uh, have a relationship with somebody that's unsaved. And God's saying, no, you shouldn't, you're not supposed to be unequally yoked. Yeah, but you know, I can't find that Christian guy, hey? I can't find that Christian girl. So let me make a way. Can happen in marriage, hey? Can happen in business. You know, you're doing deals, things. There's something that's a little bit sketchy and you're like, yeah, but I know God's given me a promise that my business is going to do well. And right now there's a famine, so let me make a way. Let me do something just to shift things around. Let me try and do something in all of this. Can come to education, hey? You're doing your exams. Any of the young people, anyone studying here, and you think to yourself, ah, it's not going to be too much of an issue if I just WhatsApp my friend and just get a few of their thoughts on the paper. You know, these are all things that eventually we're getting to a place where we're doubting God and we're doubting ourselves. So we need to be careful in uh, in this season. We need to be able to not just find a way, but to go back to God's promise. Amen? We need to find God in those moments. Go back to what God has said. The last two seasons. Fruitlessness. Genesis 21, no, sorry, Genesis 17, God gives Abraham the promise again. And it says, Abraham falls down, uh, Abraham fell face down. He laughed. And he said to himself, will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? See, after that, we read in Genesis 18, three visitors come and visit Abraham and come and visit Sarah. And one of them is referred to as the Lord. And Genesis 18 says this. It says, Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? And so we see in these two instances, 
the promise is taking so long that they just laughed. That ever happened to you? <laughs> hey, you're like, <laughs> I know last year was a bit of a crazy year for me. Uh, you know, moving out to Mitchell's plane and being held up and hijackings and all these things. And, you know, there's points that, like, you just start laughing at the whole situation. Like, then I got bitten by a spider that really turned into an extremely bad situation. Then my car had issues. And you just go, <laughs> you just start laughing. Because you're just like, this is ridiculous. Come on, God. Like, really? That's the point they were at when it came to the promise. They're just like, come on. We're 99 years old. That's 24 years after the promise. That's a long time. Who's 24 years here? Who's 24 years old? Anyone? 25, 23? That's a long time. That is a long time to wait for something. And then got into the place where they're so f in their heads and their hearts, so fruitlessness, they just laughed. But we need to stop laughing. Hey, we need to start believing. We need to get that faith back in those seasons of fruitfulness when you're just like, man, I don't even know. And that may happen this year. That may happen this year. You, you may be going into this new year and thinking to yourself, goodness, this is going to be the year. Anybody said that prayer or said that statement? Hey, this is going to be the best year. <laughs> I don't say that anymore. But you know what? We go into these new years and we think this is going to be it. This is going to be the year where my business booms. This is going to be the year that I get married. This is going to be the year that I finish my degree. These are going to be, this is going to be the year and things start to happen and you're just like, man, are we back here again? Are we back into this whole fruitlessness situation? And we lose our faith. And God says, stop laughing about it. Start believing. And lastly, the last season here is fulfillment. And Genesis 21 says this, And now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said. And the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. And when his son Isaac was eight years old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. 100 years old. 25 years had passed between the promise and the fulfillment of the promise. This shows me that God's not really in a hurry, is he? <laughs> it's like, really, God? 25 years? We could have done this in five years. God's like, no, because the verse there in verse 2 says, at the very time God had promised him, it came about. See, God has time in his hands, hey? Even the bad things, he can turn for good. When I think of that hijacking situation, although it was traumatic at the time, when I look back now, I look back and say, God, thank you for that. Because I've learned so much out of that. I've learned so much that I'd probably do it again. God, not anytime soon. But I would do that again because I learned a lot out of that about myself, about my community, about trauma, about people. And so there are bad things. There's going to be difficult things this year. There's going to be trials. There's going to be famines. There's going to be family issues. There's going to be times where there's going to be fruitlessness and you're just like, God, let me take this into my own hands. And God is saying, at my appointed time, it will come to pass. Do you think Abraham looked <laughs> back and said, if only I had known, hey, if only I'd known, I wouldn't have tried to make my own way and find my own way. I would have been more faithful. When I was in the famine, I wouldn't have lied and tried to cheat my way out of the situation. If only I had known. But I want to encourage you today that God knows. God knows. It doesn't say there at Abram's appointed time, at Sarah's appointed time. It says at God's appointed time. And so we may not know. But the God we love, the God we serve, he knows. He knows where you're at right now. Goodness, he knows exactly where you're at. Every struggle you're in, every season you're in, 
And you know what? The promise is going to come about. But trust him. Have that faith. Don't get to a situation where a season takes you from faith into unfaith, into impossibilities or unbelief. Don't get there. Let's keep trusting God. Amen? Let's keep trusting God. Let's keep looking to him. So what season are you in? If you're in a season of faith right now, hearing and obeying in the sacrifice and the possibilities is key. If you're in the season of famine, don't allow your faith to become unfaith and unbelief. If you're in a season of family, keep humble, keep your faith in his promises, and keep your boundaries. If you're future looking, make wise decisions for your future. If you're trying to find your own way right now, don't doubt God, don't doubt yourself, go back to what God has said. If you're fruitless, stop laughing and start believing. And if you're in the fulfillment, well, there's another promise coming then, hey, <laughs> there's more tests to come. <laughs> and so I think in these moments, you know, it's really about how we respond. And so let's just close our eyes to, in this morning. Let's take a moment with God. And you know, this morning, as I've been speaking, you may not be a Christian. You may be thinking to yourself, man, she's talking about all these things and God and that, but I, I don't even know. I, I'm not even on that spectrum. If that's you this morning, and you're saying, God, you know what? Actually, I want you in my life. I don't want to go through seasons. I, I hear these seasons. I've experienced these seasons, but I don't want to go through it by myself. I want to have faith in you. Because right now, I'm in a place of unbelief. I'm in a place where I don't have any faith. I don't even believe that, that you're there, but I want to put my heart out there, out there. And if that's you this morning, as everybody's got their eyes closed and their hands and, and, and yeah, just their heads bowed, you know what? I want you to make a, a decision this morning and say, God, I want to step into this season of faith. I want to step into this lifetime of faith. I want to believe that Jesus did die on the cross for me, that he did, he was resurrected from the dead and that I can entrust my life into his hands. So if that's you this morning, I want you to raise your hand just as no one else is looking, just as a, a signal to God to say, God, I am here. This is me this morning. I need faith, God. I need you to do something in my life. I need to believe in you. I want to believe in you.